Hello, everybody, and welcome to another wonderful evening of readings, thanks to the Windfall Reading Series. My name is Wendy Beck. I work at the Public Library, Eugene Public Library, of course, and I'm really glad you could all join us for what will be the last of the season. Don't panic. We're only taking three months off, but for the last Windfall Reading of the season. We'll start again in September, so um, you can have a small break. And wonderfully, you can come back all summer long and you can see these um, wonderful readings on YouTube. So don't despair, you can watch them over and over again. Uh, just a couple of things. First, I wanted to offer my um, uh, gratitude for a couple of different groups. First, the Lane Literary Guild. Uh, they are the people who put on this wonderful Windfall series and without which we would not be here enjoying the authors this evening. So thank you so much for all the programs that you do and the wonderful seminars and, and uh, classes and the readings. So thank you so much. And also a huge thanks to the Eugene Public Library, Friends of the Eugene Library specifically. Um, they do fundraising, they do programs as well, and they help us do so much. Without them, we could not have this program. We wouldn't be able to have all the children's program, adult program, summer reading, which is gonna be happening very soon um, without their support. So thank you so much to the friends as well. There are a couple of ways in which you can ask questions of the authors. Uh, we'll do a question and answer at the end of the readings. You are more than welcome to do your comments just straight on YouTube, right below this video. You can type in the comments that you have or the questions that you'd like to have answered, and we'll be able to do that at the end. And let me just put up my email address, which is right here. You are also welcome to email me. If you're feeling shy or you just have a question that you don't want to show up on YouTube, give me a, a shout out at wbeck at eugene-or.gov and I will check my email throughout the reading and I'll be glad to read your question on air at the end. So those are the two things I just wanted to talk about. And I also uh, now would like to introduce Henry Alley of the Lane Literary Guild. So I'll bring him up here. Let me get rid of that for you. Hello, Henry. Hi, Wendy. Glad to be here. Excellent. It's a pleasure to be here uh, once again for our Windfall reading series. And we have two wonderful readers tonight, uh, as usual, and Susan Leslie Moore and also Judith Montgomery. And they are just remarkable poets. Before I go into uh, the credentials of our first reader, I would like to mention that the Lane Literary Guild has been around since 1984. I happened to be around at that time when we met, I believe, very close to the Lamette River, had a picnic and talked about the formation of this wonderful organization. And Ingrid Wendt and Bill Sweet were a part of that organizational effort. Actually, they were our two leaders. And it's wonderful to think about them and their vision, which has extended through these various decades. I've been president of the Guild both back in 1986 and then more recently about three years ago. And I very much have enjoyed seeing how this organization has evolved over time. We have critique groups and we have readings and we have workshops and we have tapped into a very, very active and rich literary experience here in Lane County. We also bring in people from nearby and sometimes a little further than that as well. I wanted to mention that we have formed through Shelley Wilburn, uh, Sherry Wilburn's efforts, the lanewriters.org or the Lane Writers Network which you can tap into and see not only featured writers from the Lane Literary Guild, but you can also tap into literary events such as readings outside of our organization as well. And I, I highly recommend it. And you can see the backgrounds of various writers that have put their profiles on this, this link. Uh, also, I want to mention Tsunami Books, which is our wonderful literary bookstore. We're very, very fortunate to have a community bookstore in our community. They are a vanishing breed 
and Scott Landfill is one of our very, very greatest supporters. We've actually even had um, critique groups meet there and, of course, readings from our various various writers. So here's the phone number. And um, for example, uh, Judy Montgomery's book, Mercy, will be arriving there in a few days, and you can easily order that. And also, of course, you can order Susan Leslie Moore's new book there as well, and he can special order it for you. So that's some of the overview of what we have here uh, in the Lane Literary Guild. I'm going to now uh, introduce our first reader, who is uh, Susan, Susan Leslie Moore. Her poetry has appeared in the New York Times Magazine, New York Quarterly, Best American Poetry 2020, Poetry Northwest, Willow Springs, and elsewhere. She edited the online magazine Caffeine, Caffeine Destiny for 13 years and is one of the editors of the anthology Alive at the Center, Contemporary Poems from the Northwest, published by Ulligan Press. She is the winner of the Juniper Prize in Poetry and her first full-length collection, That Place Where You Opened Your Hands, was published by the University of Massachusetts Press. Exploring identity and the exterior and interior lives we create throughout the natural world, language, and relationships, the poems of this collection bring the ordinary rhythms of life and motherhood into coexistence with wilder truths. As Moore writes, quote, if I can't be singular in purpose, let me be quietly adrift. But these are not quiet poems. Susan Moore lives in Portland and is the director of programs for writers at Literary Arts. Of her earlier work, Dara Weir, Juniper Prize for Poetry judge and author of You Good Thing, has said, Moore is unafraid of rhyme song, of poetry's brazen scales, of wanting to leave her life in order to see more, more widely. She wants to hover above. She practices a deadpan forthrightness and prayer-like incantation. This is a wondrous book that leaves us understanding we must continue where it begins. And I, I do want to say for this wonderful book that has just appeared, uh, I was particularly struck by the sense of refuge that's in some of these poems. And uh, I see it as connected with what she calls um, the red house and also how she gives uh, animation to uh, to things like flowers, to things like landscape. And I just wanted to read from this poem, uh, The Fuchsia, the Orange and the Dahlias. It says, a neighbor pulled a tapestry from the shelf and we noticed how bright the colors were, how the orange and fuchsia in the bird's wings made it seem not mythical, but fleeting and how the dahlias woven into the garden held a message of purpose or the signs of a leisure we couldn't possess. So even the flowers have a particular language to them and that's part of the, the very striking aspects of her poetry. So uh, it's my great pleasure to introduce our first reader, Susan Leslie Moore. Hello, thank you, Henry, for that introduction. That was really lovely. I don't, um, and uh, it's so good to be. Um, well, I've read for Windfall before, and it's always, and I used to live in Eugene, so there's always that great moment where I could say, like, oh, it's so great to be in Eugene. But um, it's great to be in my house with the Eugene Public Library logo on my screen. So thank you so much, and thanks to the library. Um, so I'm going to read some poems uh, from my book. Um, this first one's called Beginning. Um, Beginning. I was born, maybe. Maybe I was torn from a cloud and a bird set me down on the ground. Maybe I missed the sky. Maybe my mother's violin was the music that led me to her. Maybe I first appeared in a palm tree or the dust on an Iowa farm. Maybe I grew up out of the earth a bulb someone shoved in the dirt and forgot until I emerged. Maybe I learned the word mother like a wish scribbled on the back of a matchbook, like a hymn we never get right. Convince me I wasn't made from an orange squeezed over a Petri dish or pulled from the sand of a California beach. My ancestors gazed at the sky and plucked me from the atmosphere. They sang hymns about heaven and farming. The hymns I like best are the ones where we get to walk with Jesus in the garden. He tells me I am his own and then he disappears. 
Remind me how I landed here, how my mouth and fingers look like your mouth and fingers. Remind me I'm an animal inside a ghost of those who came before me. And the sound a violin makes is the sound of the sun in bloom. And whenever I think I've had enough of the sky, it changes. The clouds shift into a pattern that looks like a parade of giant baby heads or a carpet of floating whales. And if I could lift my voice to the rafters, if I could float beyond the trees, maybe I'd remember why I came. Um, this is another starting poem, it's called From the Start. From the Start. If I can't be blameless, let me be superior in my mistakes. If I can't be singular in purpose, let me be quietly adrift. Make me adored and clothed in pine cones. Make me treed. Let me eat by recipe, love by touch. Let me direct the forest fire so it misses the front porch completely. Give me a way to see past Thursday. Give me a fishing pole and a tambourine. If I can't be beautiful, let me be quick. Show me where the deer wander when the bats come out. Give me an owl in the tent at midnight, a crow in the basement at dawn. Let me sing on the roof when the planes depart. Let the planes carry my song to the water. If I can't be downtown, give me a museum. Give me a still life with lemons and a dead bird. Give me a Cornell box and a rare photograph of a Parisian street before the war. Find me a docent with a story to tell. A forgery replaced by a fake replaced by the real thing. Let me lie down with a guitar and a birdcage. Make me green and well considered. If I can't be unraveled, let me be tucked in. So this one's called uh, Bats. And um, for those of you who don't know, you can lie in the poem. And this first uh, line in the poem is definitely a lie, but I like saying it. So bats. I like the way bats fly toward my hair at dusk, like I might be the tree they've been searching for. I'm territory. I had a dream where someone called mom, mom, and I sat up in bed and said, what? I'm marked. Today I boasted how well I could wield a kitchen knife and you knew I was lying as soon as I opened the drawer, the one with all the knives. I wonder how it feels to have wings instead of arms, to exist in two frequencies. Some bats can't feel the sky without another bat telling them where it is, but some learn to navigate the space between buildings alone. I'm tired of not knowing what comes next, which is a bad way to live. After the afterlife, what then? I'm prepared to come back as a mouse or a mule deer, but don't think I'll be content with just dirt. I loved sideways like a train that swerves right before it collides with another train. I lived like a Ferris wheel. I like to think of the river as a series of raincoats flung off by people long before us. I like to think of you sleeping next to me like you've always been there. I had a feeling you would show up today is something I never got tired of saying, like feelings could get us anywhere. If I open the door onto the balcony, if I knock down the wall between my apartment and my neighbors, would I be able to walk through? If I could see by the sound my singing made when it bounced into people or trees, would that make me a better person? What would I do with all that awareness? If the river were a swimming pool, how far could I swim? before I had to come up for air. This poem also has a Ferris wheel in it, I think. Yes, it does. <laughs> uh, it's called Inside Our House is Another House. Inside our house is another house where everything we say to each other flies around the walls and fireplace before coming quietly to rest on top of our heads. Above our roof is another roof where birds organize the sky. Laying aside all our stored up hurts, we slip into bed and burrow to the center of the mattress where someone has built a small theme park. If I shrink myself fast enough, I can ride the Ferris wheel before dark. 
If I leave a trail of popcorn, the tiny lions will escape from their cages. We string lights around the ceiling beams and lean out the bedroom window to see if the wind is strong enough for kites. With the right knife and string, I could build one from a broken chair and ferns. In some situations, you might find me amazing or more than a little ordinary. What if I filled the bathtub with water and let it overflow until all the furniture floated? Then we could swim through the house and decide what to save. What would you think of me then? Um, this next poem is called Eve and it's about that Eve, <laughs> uh, Adam's friend. So this is called Eve. I didn't know where I was headed. I, all I knew was I wanted to go somewhere. I heard the animals shifting in their beds of leaves and dirt. I wanted to speak, but no words would follow. The clouds taught me it's better to listen. My mouth closed like a purse, my heart shoved behind my throat where it belonged. Apples glowed in the trees. There were signs all around me, if only I could read them. Geese in pairs. Magnolia blossoms on the ground like discarded dresses of tiny women. I wanted to fall into sleep like a well, to close my eyes and wake up changed. I made a guitar from the branches of a willow and played it near the water's edge. Snakes vibrated in the grass. I wanted to sing but could only play my instrument. Apples fell like arrows and I tried to read their message, to stay or wander farther to slip into darkness and sleep like a lamb or stay awake forever. I stained my lips with berries, kissed the trees to leave my mark. No one told me not to. Okay, and this one's called, I have tried hard to have appropriate feelings, which is really true, <laughs> have. I have tried hard to have appropriate feelings. I have folded them away like sweaters. Kept my distance from the moon, visited the sick. I am proud of the life in my head. Nobody knows the garden I've seen. I am tender with the suburb. Some days even the ceiling worries me the way it keeps the roof on. I only cry when the polar bears get to me, the ones stranded on the melting ice. Otherwise, I'm kept in line by the steady curve of my driveway, the tight fists of the roses. I can easily converse about the sweet peas and our eventual disintegration. The sky has more to say to me than I could ever hear, given the restricted space between houses. Frogs sing at night and the whine of the train. So um, I'm gonna read a couple of new poems and then maybe go back to the book. Um, so these next three poems are kind of, um, I wrote them last summer when we were deep in COVID. Uh, I wrote them, they're all three from the same kind of um, weird little prompt exercise, which I'll explain after I read the poems. Um, so this first one uh, is called A Miniature Park Bench Under a Giant Tree. A miniature park bench under a giant tree is how I feel about myself in relation to existence. Sometimes it feels like the seasons have stopped and we remain in one continual present. It's hard to get quiet enough to know what I really want. This morning I looked at the neighbor's yard and thought after the peonies, the daffodils will bloom. I'm losing my sense of the order of things. I'm a ladybug hunting for aphids in a parking lot. Slipping into remembering is dangerous if you return with no insights. My favorite photos of people I used to know are ones where they look straight into the camera. There are many kinds of bookmarks, but nothing like a folded page. Uh, I lift my heart to the pine trees, but they never notice me. I'd like to thank everyone for getting me here today, especially the coffee maker and the toaster oven. Maybe the morning dove perched on the telephone wire thinks that's how you make a phone call. Remember when weeding was important. Now I want every plant to grow and spread. The more reckless, the better. 
I want to shrink everything I own into one drawer so I have room for more stuff. When I was a kid, I walked everywhere alone. The swimming pool, movie theater, library. Still, I am unprepared for this moment. The seeds you shove in the ground first are sometimes the last to bloom. Don't look for yourself in photos of long gone relatives. Time is a fox hunting you. <laughs> um, the flagpole in my neighbor's yard seems like it's trying too hard to remind us of something we can't remember. I'm lucky to have gotten this far is not something I'm used to saying, but I do like the signs people put on their lawns with love wins in giant letters. I'd like to look into a rat's mouth while someone held open its jaws. The flowers in the neighborhood can't bear the strain of all our attention now that there's not much to do. I want to plant snapdragons under my neighbor's windows and hide in the bushes to see their reaction. I'd like to weave a giant tapestry and hang it on the wall. I'd like to rearrange the furniture, but I don't know where I'd put it. Time is a fish caught in your net. So the exercise, the prompt or whatever um, thing was in a book. It was by Matthew Zapruder. And so the instructions were you, you go for a walk and you just like notice just things that you see. And you make like a list of things that you see and you come back and then you choose a couple of things in the list to um, make into, you know, a full line. And then you write a line in response to that line. So you do that a couple of times. And then, so, you know, you have a block of lines and then you go back and you um, remove the original lines. So all you have is the response lines. But then the final step is to connect them all. And I just didn't want to connect them. because So um, that's how those came about. But it's funny to read them now because I just can remember that kind of surreal sense we all had last last summer about things were so different and weird and going for walks seemed like about all you could do right um so here's a couple newer poems this is called a uh, night of the living if the constellation of stars above your house looks like a woman skating across a lake you could name it that if someone long before you called it warrior with a sword or dragon at the gate, it doesn't matter. It's your sky now. If you're lost in the evening fog, all your former selves line up by the side of the road to show you the way home. If you want to pry open the moon and crawl inside, remember the sky waits like a clock for you to unwind. The planets contain the fur of woolly mammoths and fossilized ferns that never got to be trees. Your position relative to them is what you think about when night is a rabbit hole and sleep is a coin toss. A hand moves across your face in a dream you are having about being alive. When you wake up, the hand disappears along with the way it felt to be dreaming on the edge of some great adventure. The shadows of owls against the trees are not owls, but you can pretend the sound of branches against the window is someone trying to get in. You can breathe and imagine the night breathes with you. Uh, this one's called Taxonomy. The great thing about this platform is that you can see if you're if you're on screen or not, but and right below when you're on screen it says you're in the show. So <laughs> I'm in the show. <laughs> Exciting. Um, so this is called taxonomy. A group of mathematicians is an equation, unless they are at a party and then they are a problem. Two or three architects is a situation. More than that, and the building collapses. A subdivision snakes through property that used to be farmland. Part of the field remains, and a few rusted tractors linger like men at a grange hall gathering who would rather mumble to each other than dance. My son worries about gentrification in the old neighborhood. He thinks no one will have a place to live. Pray for the view of the mountains that will soon be obstructed by condominiums. Unless you find tall buildings beautiful, then rejoice at the way concrete obliterates the field. A group of condo dwellers is the answer to a question posed by developers everywhere but no one knows the question or how to measure its importance. 
When I was seven, I lived across the street from a horse and fed it apples from a tree nearby. Its mouth scared me. I thought it might devour my hand if it had the chance. Maybe it thought my hand was part of the apple. A horse behind a fence is progress, but only if you're not the horse. The first time I let my kids walk to school by themselves, I went with them to the end of the street and watched until they arrived at the top. They turned and waved at me, standing at the bottom of the hill. Did I tell them I would stand and wait, or did they just know? Then they turned the corner out of my sight to walk the few remaining blocks to school alone. Now my children are adults. A mother with grown children is a controlled experiment. How long can she go without thinking of them and how she used to hold their entire bodies in the width of her arms? Uh, this call is called As the Sparks Fly Upward, and it has um, a line from the Jiminy Cricket song, When You Wish Upon a Star. Um, so, if your heart is in your dreams, no request is too extreme. Maybe some of you remember that. That's from the movie Pinocchio. Um, so, As the Sparks Fly Upward. My favorite part of the universe is the atmosphere beyond the Milky Way, where stars that have yet to be named drift towards each other on a collision course that won't end in my lifetime. Does anything inhabit them or is it only dust and Swiss cheese? When I was a kid, my favorite record was Jiminy Cricket singing When You Wish Upon a Star on a 45 I played over and over on my portable record player. If your heart is in your dreams, no request is too extreme. But what if, if your heart, what if your heart is in your darkest self? You might turn into a donkey. Some people still believe the earth is flat and pictures the astronauts sent from space are forged. Maybe they think if a surgeon cut them open, they wouldn't find organs, just a miniature train set carrying their blood from place to place. The scientist who first saw cells under a microscope didn't name them after prison, but the room's monks inhabit in between vespers. He was studying a piece of cork. Sometimes seeing feels like praying, especially when no one understands when you tell them it's not just cork, it's all of us, our bodies assembled like honeycombs. My favorite part of coming home is the man standing in my kitchen who I would never describe as not having a care in the world, but who somehow makes me feel careless, like I could throw a kitten off the roof and he'd catch it. There is mystery in everything is another way of saying, no one is sure why we have clouds. Some people like the sky best when it's empty and waiting for us to introduce ourselves. Hello, stranger, what took you so long? I'm gonna read a few more from my book and then I'll just about be done. And um, I would never throw a kitten from the roof if you were, if you were worried about that. Um, there's a, a, a uh, uh, a sequence of poems in my book that's kind of like, it's not, they're not, it's like a sonnet crown, but they're not sonnets, but a crown is where um, the last line of the poem, first poem becomes the first line of the next poem. So I'm not gonna read the whole sequence, but um, I'll read a couple of them. And it doesn't have um, titles, it's just little asterisks. But when you're doing a reading, you don't wanna say asterisk, right? So you're gonna have to, you just have to take my word for it. Oh, my mechanical heart, my wind up sigh and stutter, my mistakes, my flower beds, my resistible sheets, my lazy arms. Oh, my unwise counsel, my loss, my wifeness, my echo. Let the crows argue over the lawn, let the dirt sing its wormed through song. My mouth is the freshest vegetable. My mouth is the freshest vegetable. My cleverness doesn't shimmer, doesn't protect. The sky shines like a photograph of the sky. Flashes of weather and geese. Crows dive into trees as if to devour them. Crows in love with the trees because trees live in the sky. Come closer trees. Which crow would you give up for me? Uh, 
Which crow would you give up for me? Which dress would you lend the sky? A dress to wear for the rain. The rain marries the ground and the sky disappears like a lost nickel. The rain, a music I miss when the rain stops. To say I want for nothing would be to lie down in the sky, to say the sky was mine. So there's two more poems in that sequence, but um, I'm not gonna read them. You'll have to buy the book to see how it turns out, right? <laughs> um, uh, I'm just gonna read a few more poems, if I can find them here. Okay, what am I doing? Okay. Um, okay, this one's called Telescope versus Microscope. It's my version of a superhero movie. Telescope versus Microscope. All those tiny bugs that crawl along my eyelids, devouring dead skin. The edge of space like a hotel room before your shoes drop in the corner and your body creases the taut sheets. The smallest inhalation of breath when fog moves into the yard. If I could hover above my life like an astronaut, I might see how I misunderstood the shape of it. A chain of events linked by repeating attempts to find a piece of ground that fits. This is my last poem. You've been a great audience, although I can't see you. I know that I can, I know that you're there. <laughs> Surrender. The bark stacked on the ground with tracks of insects that bore into it for food is all that's left of the trees. I work hard to abandon my former selves. I climb into them at night, then step out of them each morning. Giving up the fight is not the same as letting go, and letting go is more like how an animal leaves its body only when every part is extinguished. When every part of me is shimmered through like a river flushed from its shore. When I give up what the sky has done to me. Then the singing begins. Thank you. Thanks so much, Susan, for your wonderful and vivid reading. Really appreciate it and the lovely sequence that you chose. And before um, I introduce Judy, I, I just want to um, mention again that Susan's book, along with Judy's books, um, can be available from Tsunami Books. So you may want to get on the phone uh, when you can and, and order them um, as soon as possible. All right, uh, I wanna also mention before I introduce Judy that we have another um, series here in Eugene, the River Road Reading Series. And it is available on Zoom. You just have to put River Road Reading Series, the RRRS, uh, in Google and it will take you to their website and they will be having a Zoom reading on Sunday, May 30th from 4.30 to 6 p.m. and Al Rimpel, A. Molotov, and Gary Lark will be reading their work. So you might want to have a look at that and you can also go on the website and see their various rich backgrounds. Our second reader tonight is uh, Judy Montgomery. We're very glad to have her. And I would um, like to talk a little bit about her background. She moved from Portland to Bend for two decades and has now returned to the Valley, this time in Oregon City, where she mends her garden post ice storm and loves to read poems and figure out how other poets do what they do. Her poems appear in the Bellingham Review, Prairie Schooner, and Tahoma Literary Review, among other journals, as well as in a number of anthologies. She's been awarded fellowships in poetry from Literary Arts and the Oregon Arts Commission, residencies from Playa, Apatea in the Woods, and Caldera, in prizes from the Bellingham Review, Persimmon Tree, and elsewhere. Her first collection, Passion, received the 2000 Oregon Book Award for Poetry. Her second collection, Red Jess, appeared in 2006 from Cherry Grove Collections. Her chapbook, Pulse and Constellation, was a finalist for the Finishing Line Press Competition and appeared in 2007 from the press. 
Her second full book, Litany for Wound and Bloom, appeared from Utter Chaos Press in August 2018, one of our um, publishing companies here in town. And because she has been a caregiver for her parents and husband, many of her poems spring from interest in medicine and the body. Her prize-winning narrative medicine book, Mercy, appeared from Wolfridge Press, Wolfridge Press in March 2019. She holds a doctorate in American literature from Syracuse University and loves talking about and teaching other people's poetry. And um, I just wanted to, to mention this the very striking uh, patterns of healing and grief in her work. And in um, Litany for Wound and Bloom, I was struck so much by this description of a, of a child cemetery for pets uh, in the poem proper, it says, the plot is sacred to our children, their beloved animals laid out in makeshift shrouds of sheets, cardboard boxes, crayon, digger, flower, beagle, painted turtle, now Susie, kitten killed by the local raccoon. Um, just the, the sense of pathos in that and the, the vividness of the images is just so striking. And then from her, uh, from another one of her books, Mercy, uh, struck very much by the pattern of healing images in it and uh, in that there's a refuge in a poem called Little Mutable uh, where in a butterfly center we get images of the butterflies as a, a kind of refuge from from the quest to, to get well that's that's going on in the series of poems. We have this as we pass through the paired doors after the dark narrow tunnel has yielded us up, we enter the great crystal chamber, three-storied loft and flicker, harp strung in sun into a waver of shadow lace, green swerve of intertwined palm and spiring ginger, ginger lush habitat for the fantastic. And they appear, reappear, hosts of butterflies flare. So uh, without further ado, uh, Judy Montgomery. Hello, thank you for um, watching and thank you for having me. Thanks to uh, Windfall and Hank and to the Eugene Library um, and also by extension to Tsunami who carries our books, which is just a wonderful thing. Um, I'm gonna be reading from Mercy tonight first and then some poems from a working manuscript. I have been awarded um, an arts residency at Hypatia in the Woods beginning in the middle of June. It was actually a word for last June, but then you know what happened then. So they said, how about this June? So I get to go in just a few weeks and do some more work. Um, I, I need to start out by saying, listening to Susan's work, this is a poet who dwells in so much possibility. There's this, but that, and if, and then, and a fantastic imagination. It was just a pleasure listening to Susan. So um, for my work, I'm going to begin and end, this is not usual for me, with love poems. Um, the first one is from an earlier chapbook. It's called Paradise, and it seemed appropriate because it's May and rhododendron season. Paradise, let lovers simmer in rhododendron heat, arch under sun's caress, bloom pendulous as rose pears, a juice of color staining their cheeks. Let them soak in blossom blush, fall slowly perfect through lush May. And I set that up because yes, I'll be talking about illness and death and who knows what else. Um, so, so you've got a little positive thing to start with. Um, then I'm gonna read several poems from Mercy. Um, the book documents um, my husband's and my journey from 2004 through today of a serious illness he had. And when you get married and you say for better, for worse, and so on, you, you don't really think the worst is going to happen until it does. So these poems are dedicated to all those of you now who are caregivers and patients, and those of you who were caregivers and patients, and those of you who will be, which covers everybody. Um, the first poem is the opening poem in the book. It's called Cozy. Tonight we bolt the door draw trout print curtains to shut away the fraught world, escaped. 
This remote river cabin, hours for 48 hours. Slipping from love-rumpled feather bed and sheets, we admire the coved ceiling, the wide pine planks that glow overhead, thick enough to keep out driving rain or freeze, safe. The cut stone fireplace ablaze, we curl close on a plump couch. Sweetness drifts from chipped green mugs. Tonight, nothing can disturb us, not storm, not phone, not even cancer, who squats on our stoop, flipping his gold coin and lazy arcs. The clock ticks to Monday when he knows we'll have to crack the only door, fire up the truck. He will ride between us, cozy, he'll think, his silent good humor chilling our blood as he hums and nods pleasantly, first to you, then to me, one hand lightly resting on each near thigh. So we're talking seven hour surgeries, we're talking major awful chemos, just such difficult things that happen. So I also want to offer you hope in this next poem. It's called Ghosted. My hiking sticks won't hold. The road beneath my feet cracks in ice. Hunkered under clods of snow, blueberry junipers hang helpless for melt. I'm trying to keep my footing, despite my mind at tenter hooks tight to the ICU's stark light, your body pierced with tubes and anchored to monitors and metal. Two tears streak and freeze burn on my cheek. Then ahead, like smoke, five deer emerge out of nowhere, finally trotting in sprung steps. They float across the way, vanish into dusking woods. Breath stops in my throat. I want to take them for a sign, their bodies fluid ease as they navigate a forest ghosted under frost, their apparitional beauty, snow-combed coats, fawn nostrils loosing clouds of moist air. They're not a sign. I know they're not a sign for your survival, but it's offered. I take it. I take it in. They talk about side effects from treatment in, in many kinds of illnesses, but particularly uh, treatment of cancer, um, because what you're basically doing is inviting poison into your body when you are undergoing chemotherapy. And it has such strong impacts. Uh, there was a time when all my husband would eat was um, cut up pineapple. That tasted good to him. There's also a wider range of side effects on the rest of the family. And um, so this poem is called, is called Side Effects. She has dug a foot deep ragged hole in my garden, dug deep beneath my early girl tomato, toppled its cage of sticks, its thumb thick stems, its starry yellow blossoms and heavy seeded fruit, toppled the whole ripe body flat, roots exposed, dry, dying, and I am smacking her flank. I'm holding her collar and hitting my dear shelter rescue dog, shouting bad dog, bad, and shoving her speckled muscle down into the crummy hole to show her just what she has done. My dog who doesn't know why I am doing what I'm doing, her memory of the dig long gone, how her tidy paws rooted, bent on seizing some invading beast that she had to grab before it got away. And I know that I am not being just. No, even as my hand comes down that it's not her and not the whole, not even the tomatoes. It's the new drips and drugs, the side effects, the blank chemo stare the flesh that vanishes despite me from my husband's raked body. And so I hit her while the tears bang down my cheeks. I am breaking her heart. I am breaking mine. When um, surgery didn't seem to do the job, we were told that chemo would be the thing to try next. Um, 
And so we had to go to the infusion room. Some of you no doubt will have been in one. And it's pretty scary to walk in the door and look around and think, what is actually going to happen here? There are all these people in these soft chairs. They all look really ill, which of course this patient is too, with the drips and the nurses. And it just feels like a very foreign experience. Mercy, we shiver. The room is not cold. We're sweatered up, red for you, blue for me, artery, vein, going and coming, we wait on needles. You roll up your sleeve, expose a blue vein, pulse under winter skin, infuse to pour into. Nearby, nurses lift the plump sacks, poisons mixed to pour fire into flesh, yours, others, Eight stations of strangers propped, pillow chaired about the scrubbed room as the nurses come and go in these hushed halls of chemo, flicking scarlet nails to restart a clogged line. One blue scrubs, bluer eyes, stops before us, tray of sharps held at her waist. Liz, she kneels by your side, seeks your eyes and mine to assess the level of our dread lays her hand on yours, murmurs, we'll look after you, slips a swift needle under swabbed skin. Anything, she looks at me, call me for anything. Rising, she turns to attend to our neighbor's port. You doze under meds, I watch still on edge as she leans to retrieve a chart. Her sleeve rides up past her elbow's pale skin. In the tender flesh, the mouth of an old reddened scar. What's that? Someone asks. Oh, that, she says. My stepfather stubbed his cigarette out on me. I'm not meant to hear, but I have. I flinch. Sudden before me, the child's bared arm, her scrabbling feet as she tries to escape. His grip, her cry. How could she turn burn? to mercy. Wounded, she heals. Blessed, we dare to drink from the bitter cup. Mercy is dedicated to this nurse who is absolutely amazing and who ended up with breast cancer herself and was able to come back to work. So for um, a slightly lighter touch here, also in the same book, but there is an opportunity for a little playfulness and maybe revenge. This poem is called Remission. The old blue prayer book used to simmer in its slot, reminding us to own up to things done or left undone. Only then could we ask for our sins to be sent back. What remission meant to say, return to sender, though it wasn't clear exactly who had sent them or where they might end up. I pictured some dead letter office in the sky where scuffed packages rose to a ceiling of transparent angels. Still, it wasn't easy to imagine room in heaven for all those taped up bundles. Much more tempting to sway to Elvis's lament, return to sender, address unknown. To swear we'd keep those precious letters, giddy girls pressing his missives straight into our hearts. On my knees today, I'm puzzling how return to sender works for cancer. Remission, gift read by radiology, offered in the doctor's office. Our white coated team has beaten back again that invasion, but remission isn't cure, it's temporary respite. Sent back's not good enough for us. I want every hungry cell hijacked, thrust deep into a box like a coffin, lid slammed shut, taped tight, package set outside in freezing fog, waiting for UPS to pick it up, stow it in that comfortably dirt brown truck. Parting the curtains in our living room, we'd raised trembling hands to say, Godspeed, farewell, which we do not mean. We mean get out of town and don't come back. Hurrying, breathing free at last, the truck would gear up the drive, 
its brown-robed driver, raising one hand to bless us as he heads out into what we trust will be a bone-cold, occluding mist. Somebody might call a get back for cancer. Um, I'm going to switch next to um, the poems that will be in my next um, manuscript, which I, I planned to call And Yet until I discovered that Christopher Hitchens has a whole book of essays, so it'll have to have a different name. Um, but I thought I'd have something a little lighter as a transition, uh, one of the poems from it. Um, in addition, this, this book is about the body, the family, and mortality. And included in it are several poems that are odes or in praise of various body parts. I have one for the breastbone, one for my ankle, one for my heart. And this is a, a recent poem um, just published uh, this year called Ode to Meniscus. And those of you who've had knee surgery know that there are two menisci, one on either side of your knee. It's tough cartilage that protects it. And uh, when I looked up meniscus, meniscus goes, it means lunar crescent. And so who could resist that? Ode to meniscus. Oh, marvelous meniscus, crescent moon plucked convex and congave out of starry dark. You enter every human body, dock and fender between hard headed tibia and femur, white shin and thigh bones as they tend to grind fierce and find gasping us to ground, twinned and settling deep within each knee's will to swivel, you let us clamber down from ancient arbor homes, lope on grass-gleamed plains, ease past twist and grimace, migrate striding over alp abyss. O oh, paired gems, menisci, faithful even torn and stitched, still you lighten human ways and wanders, by stormy noon, by starless night, you float us, O oh best buffers, O oh supple and invisible arcs of moon reflecting blessing. I had a lot of fun with that one. I love reading the dictionary and looking up root words, which I recommend to every writer if you're not already doing that. Um, Okay, so the next poem, uh, these are, this is one of the family poems. Um, my husband and I moved over to Bend in 2001, and within a couple of years, it became apparent that my mother was not doing well, and my parents needed to move into some sort of retirement home instead of being in their house. So we talked them into coming over near us um, into uh, independent living. And um, my mother was eventually diagnosed with Alzheimer's, but of course it shows up a lot before an actual diagnosis. And they used to come over for dinner uh, almost weekly and we'd uh, take them out to the hairdressers and so on. But the family dinners were always an important part of their lives and ours. On the comb as outward and visible sign, her white hairs been wind roughed the way a dandelion's haloed globe drifts open. And when my mother stops, four steps inside our house, my father stops behind her and draws her comb, blue as the virgin's cloak, from his pocket. With exquisite care, he redeems each blown strand into its proper curve. Although she does not know she's must, or even that he combs, her arms already open to claim the hug she craves from each of us, while the eager spaniel wreathes about our halted bodies, while my husband waits to slip inside and shut the door behind. It's as though every atom in the room lights here on the comb, on my father's office of attendance. He who abandoned what he thought was a calling to the priesthood leaving off the white collar, the black woolen cloak, his years of Latin and Greek, who shut firmly behind him the brass hinged seminary door to step pride glowing on his arm into this other life of devotion, vowing to make her life at last perfect and she perfectly loved. And here she stands, hair gleaming even while her mind as the ministering comb 
blue uh, sky or heaven is raised and stroked and lowered. And our family stops lowering its head to bow again before the contract, the blessing. My husband and I were both married before and so have children from our previous uh, marriages. I have two sons and um, one of them, the older, has been suffering from a, a varieties of, of cancer for several years. Um, and at one point, um, more than one point has been told he would have to go into hospice and somehow they've retrieved him from the edge over and over. So this poem is for him. I, uh, he's told me that he's watching tonight along with his fiance. So Andrea, this is for you. Um, the title is the name of a tree crab apple with in parentheses the scientific name malice after it. Crab apple. Malice, shorn of last year's extravagant display, pink petaled snow on resurrecting grass below, the crabapple in my garden creaks and shudders under February ice. I must trust that still the tree prepares for sap rise, its hidden spread of roots and rootlets to feed the emptied crown. Sometimes a storm will expose the root wad's grip when a crabapple's canopy collapses under ice. The tangled web, a maze of stones and boulders thralled in subtle growth. So it is with my dear son. Just this morning, his brain cancer's greedy branching, exposed by the scanner's penetrating beam. Oligo dendro glioma. Its unrelenting tentacles eel the live winding tunnels. I know it's not malice, but I seethe as I watch my son lift his bone china cup of tea, talking of endurance. The cankered growth grows. He awaits radiation, hopes to reach April. May the tree's roots hold, its blossoms rise unblasted. And I'm happy to say that the doctors were somehow able to dispose of this, um, this time of the brain cancer. So he is uh, continuing to my delight. Um, I have just two more poems. I'm going to check my time here. Hang on. Yes, two more poems, and then I will be done. Um, this poem is about my dad, who is a mathematician and who lived to be 96. Um, his body had many problems, but his brain stayed really good. He could solve things uh, well up until the last few months. This poem is about that time. My father, the mathematician, has fallen again. The ER's white pillow bleeds fractals beneath his head. Pinned under squares of sterile light, he shouts DNR, DNR, from the gurney to an audience of zero in his curtained cubicle. Breath clots in my throat as they let me enter, I can hardly speak my name. When he understands who is with him, he tells me what has happened as though it were a story problem he has solved, despite the sharp flash of pain and light as he fell full body backward to the tiled geometry of his kitchen floor. How he remembered to press the lifeline on his wrist, how the aides called the numbers 911. But he frets about the ambulance, the required gurney, the bother to the EMTs, not to mention adding up the costs in his frugal head. He seems not to be aware that his split scalp still weeps blood, does not yet know that this fall has jarred something loose inside, concussion that in three months' time will rob his tongue of words numbers, his equation-solving mind of answers to what he knows must be simple problems. For now, he's intent on reminding anyone in the room not to bring him back if his heart stops, which it has not, not yet, even as the reddened pillow signals some essential loss. I won't remind him later of what I hear pouring from his lips. Do not resuscitate. He has long since decided he will not be a burden. Okay, 
And just one more poem. I promise to a love poem at the end. It also has medicine in it, but it's still a love poem. <clears throat> Flame blue bowl and peach. Bent above the wheelchair, a desert bone and joint, he tucks the quilt back about her knees, one hand clutching the intake desk. Her blue eyes lift to his and cling as the stitches at her hip cling to her flesh, meshing the new joint that sings of imperishable plastic, titanium glowing through flesh and vein, weaving and wearing and still cleaving to its courses as this valley's silver rills and twining trees, its tumbled pebbles, thunderheads and lily breezes seed and bloom on blue hazed hills, each atom embracing the earth's molten core that spins the gift of gravity. And as the perfusing flush of sap draws juice into the peach, and as the peach clings to the branch from which it must fall away, its sweet flesh unwrapping the ridged and wine dark pit from which it too will loosen and release, ripe peach glowing in the flame blue bowl that for an hour sweetens in September sun, and so sweetens our hands clasped across blue glass cups and plates. Our hands, darling, yours and mine, that also cling, knowing bones and bowl and flesh and peach, and even the ripe sun will release beyond any reach. So we cherish each article of cling, which sweetens as it blooms, ripens, loosens, even as it falls and falls away. Thank you so much for having me and for your attention. Thank you, Judy. Thank you again for such a rich experience. And uh, we are now uh, in the question and answer portion of our program and very fortunate to have these two wonderful poets here. Um, I believe, Wendy, we have one question from the audience that's uh, pending. Yes, we have a, a ton of, of um, messages of kindness and excitement and joy and, and um, love. Uh, the one question that we have is from... I like all that first stuff. That sounds wonderful. <laughs> it is. It is. You'll have to read it and reread it and screenshot it. And um, it's, it's fantastic. Um, somebody asks, uh, Kate Cook asks for Judy, what are the inspirational differences between Bend and Portland? <laughs> you devil cake. <laughs> she is my dear friend in Bend the inspirational differences. Well, I have a garden that no deer can get into. So I am a happy gardener, plant flowering, whatever. Um, I thought I would escape difficult weather that we had in Bend. It was minus 19 once, um, but then we had the ice storm here. So the inspiration for ice still remains. Um, I have rejoined my former poetry groups are kind enough to let me back in after 19 years. And so there's inspiration there. In Bend, I had helped start two um, poetry groups of which Cake was in one of them. And um, they, they are both needed to feed my soul as a poet. So there are some geographical differences. And of course, I'm learning to meet new people here. Um, but I don't have to, I would, the big difference is I don't have to drive over the pass in the middle of winter when my son who's ill needs help or when my new grandson, um, wants to see his grandma. So, um, missing, I miss, don't miss going over the pass. Thank you. Um, I have a question for Susan and I, I, I was particularly struck when I was, uh, reading your book of, by the long poem, and I know you couldn't read read it because of the length, but um, the the diary from the Red House. Could you talk to us a little bit about what the Red House? I know that it's a allusion also to uh, a, a painting, but could you talk about the significance of the Red House because it it has such an important um, presence in your collection? Um, you mean the significance of the poem or the significance of the red? The Red House itself, but you could, or the poem, either one, but. Um, 
that's a poem that I wrote like in maybe five hours. I just, it just came out really fast. And um, I really had a good time imagining a person that might live in that house. And then um, thinking of it, and, and it was just at a time in my life when it was just really great to get out totally outside of myself and just inhabit this other person. Mm-hmm. Um, and the, the form is not like a form that I usually do. It's a it's very kind of expansive and um, a little strange, but, um, but I felt like it grounded the poem. I get the book in a way, I mean, it's kind of like an altar, an alter persona for the, mm-hmm. in the book, you know, just another, uh, another person and, um, and a way to like explore the domestic in the 1800s rather than the yes. present. Great. Um, mm-hmm. Great. I think that's, I think that's about all I can say sure, at this point about fine. it. Yeah. Great. Um, Judy, uh, there's um, a lot of focus on uh, the parts of the body, the, the, the clinical experiences and so forth in, in the poems that you read. And I was just wondering, did you find a certain amount of freedom from focusing on those those aspects of human experience? Was there a particular kind of uh, release that you found in that kind of uh, attention? Well, in part, I sort of had it... Um forced on me a bit because of being the caregiver for my husband and my parents at the same time, which was really interesting. I have to to tell the story about, I I got so tired that when I was in Fred Meyers over in Bend, once I I was so tired that I was in the tomato sauce aisle. And I thought I could just lie down here and take a nap. People could just go around me. And then I thought, this is not a sane idea, Judy. You need to go home. So um, so part of it was just that. The other part is that when I went to college, I actually entered as a pre-med student and I was very interested in medicine and the body because that's what we have to live in and work with. And over the years, of course, um, it's come to my attention that um, if we didn't have mortality, everything would be different it conditions everything we do, say, where where we go, decisions we make. And so I've always found how that impinges on life and on the body to be really interesting. So I guess a number of things kind of, kind of came yeah. together all at once for me, and that's become a more intense source. Other poems that I have not read are some that are... Um, I want to call them political, but they respond to events of the day. Um, I've written, of course, everybody's written a poem about 9-11, and I wrote a poem about the takeover of Crimea by Russia when that happened, about um, the sinking of a ship with children on it, Korean ship, South Korean ship, um, and what happened to the the students when the the Mm -hmm. captain abandoned ship and left the students there. I'm very... um, I'm very hit in the heart by injustice. Mm-hmm. Uh, thank you. Uh, Susan, um, I, I, I sense in some of your poems kind of like uh, a sense of finding a refuge um, from the world, um, maybe in the Red House especially, but that there seems to be and again, this is just my, and you're welcome to say, no, I don't, that doesn't have anything to do with my writing, but uh, just uh, a sense of a kind of alternative reality that the poems explore as though maybe we're kind of going into, at least sometimes into a kind of Alice in Wonderland kind of experience. Is that something you saw in your poems or did you see these poems as, developing kind of the observable reality we all know and love? Probably not the latter, (laughs) but um, I don't, um, you know, maybe at different times, the the poems in the book grew out of wanting to live in a different world or be in a different place. And so maybe Mm -hmm. that's, um, yes. And not, and not really seen or having an experience about the way that you experience the world and not really seeing it reflected mm-hmm. in anything else 
Um, and so you feel like yeah, you, you created that yourself, I guess. Yeah. yeah. That makes sense. So yeah, it, does. it does completely. Yeah. 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 Um, and then you might mention just a little bit, you know, you had the poem about uh, in time of COVID. Um, for you, did COVID have an impact on your writing? Um, I myself found I couldn't write the way I normally, if there is such a way, thing that applies to me as normally writing, but but I, I just couldn't couldn't write the same way um, in the midst of COVID. Did you find that to be true or did the one poem take care of it or? No, I mean, the way I work kind of has always kind of been the same. It kind of has an ebb and a flow to it. And I've just kind of gotten used to that and not, and um, so I don't feel like it really changed during COVID except, you know, um, I mean, you can't write what the fuck over and over and over again, but you know, I mean, um, but um, so maybe the content changed a little bit, but I also felt like poet, just being able to sit down and write poetry, it's like, okay, I've always been able to do this and I can still do this now, even though the world is like yeah, yeah. very, very different. So mm -hmm. no, I mean, I think probably, probably didn't have a huge um, impact. Okay, great. We have a, uh, a question that's come up for Judy. Um, what current themes are you finding yourself writing about now? Um, well, I sort of got into that a little a little bit. I, um, when I mentioned writing some more political things, I'm trying to write about being white and recognizing that something I've said has a history to it that I don't recognize. Um, in particular, it's a poem I'm still working on, but I use the term slave driver casually in conversation. And then everything in my head stopped and I thought, oh, think about what that means that I've used it so casually. Um, so I'm working on a poem about that. Um, I'm working on a poem based on a photograph from um, Ukrainian and uh, uh, German militia shooting um, Ukrainian Jewish family that's falling into a pit. And that's in part related because I have a grandson who's who comes from Ukrainian Jewish blood. Um, and so there's a visceral connection as well as a humanitarian connection with that. Um, it was too long to read tonight. I'm still working on it. Um, but I, no matter what I write about, it always ends up being about family and often motherhood, which is funny because I never thought of myself as particularly a particularly interesting, good mother, I guess I would say, that I didn't measure up to whatever mark I had. I was never the person who went in the room and said, oh, hand me the baby. I want to hold the baby. I'm not that kind of mother. And yet, uh, uh, Litany for Wound and Bloom is basically all about motherhood. And so those, um, and now grandmotherhood, I guess, those kinds of uh, things come out for uh, as themes for me quite a bit. Great. And question has come up from our audience from John Morrison for Susan. Do you try to be funny? No. <laughs> no. Okay, and, and sometimes I, I sometimes I uh, I'm the only one that thinks I'm funny. <laughs> like no one else gets it. So no, I don't try. I don't think about that. Yeah. Thanks, John. <laughs> I know John Morrison. A uh, question from Cecilia Hagen, who's been with us for many many years. Uh, for you also, you mentioned using a prompt for the walk poems. How often do you use prompts? If you're not using a prompt, how do your poems start? How do my poems start? Um, well. I don't use prompts that often because it's I, I I find like I kind of resent being told how to do something. So even when it's just a suggestion in poetry, I mean I want to do it, come to it myself. So um, I just I write a lot in you know I keep a journal. I mean not a journal but a notebook and I and I write a lot in the notebook. I mean I really like the physical act of writing, just writing. So um, you know I do that a lot and there's just things that eventually like I'll land on something that's like, oh, okay, that's a poem and I wanna, I wanna do that, uh, make that a poem. But, um, but I really also just really like the physical act of writing. I probably like 
and sometimes I get to like, well, you've just wallowed in this enough for like months. You need to actually write <laughs> things into a poem. But um, but you know, I just I can't really push myself to be any more productive than I am. I just have a certain rhythm to it. So um, that's a long way of saying like, in general, I don't. I, the prompts I like best though are ones that are not really about content or, but they're just more about like you know, formal constraints, like, and rules, like, you know, try writing just with uh, nouns and no adjectives or, or all colors or like it, it, all the words in the, you know, have to, all the lines have to start with a word that starts with an R or those kinds of things that could kind of get you out of your head a little bit and into more thinking about, you know, words as um, materials to kind of mess around with. So, yes. yeah. Yeah, I, I took a I've taken a couple of workshops where I had that. In fact, one of the assignments was to to write a, a story in which we covered um, through the proper names the entire al alphabet. <laughs> Things like that. Okay, I think we have time for one more question for each of our readers. Um, Judy, would you like to talk a little bit about? Uh, the the child cemetery for the pets and <laughs> you very, like that one <laughs> very striking image um, or if not that the the butterfly museum or both um, they're both very striking and again I, I got in this this case too as I said in some of Susan's work there was a kind of sense of refuge going on um, in both okay. cases which we all need these days. Yes. The only mental refuge from all the news and things coming in about mm -hmm. Israel and Palestine and everything else going on in the world. Um, yeah, I, I would like to talk about the, uh, the butterfly one, um, uh, Mutable Flame. Um, we, we were sent, when things looked really bad after the first surgery, you know, and they were going to start chemo, but they didn't know what to do next because chemo doesn't work very well on my husband's very rare cancer. So they sent us down to MD Anderson for, um, you know, a second opinion, basically. And um, so while we were there, you can't see them all the time. You know, they send you off, they'll see you, and then they go think about it, and they send you off. There are these fabulous museums right there. And we went to this um, butterfly palace that was part of the Natural History Museum. And I fell so in love with it. Phil just went off to the rest of the Natural History Museum. He's a biologist. I spent all my time there because it just seemed magical. It was two stories and there were these butterflies and they eat different things and they would land on you. And in the poem, I get kind of jealous because one lands on Phil's shirt and doesn't land on me. And I thought, well, what am I chopped liver? And um, but then I thought, oh, well, he's the one who needs the healing. And so I took, I had a little tape recorder with me. And so I took all these notes about everything I saw, you know, just details, not knowing how I'd use them, the colors of the butterflies and the kinds of plants and which eat fruit and all this stuff. And then I got home and uh, we were still going through chemo and various things. And so I went m later and turned the tape recorder on and I had pushed the wrong button. There was no, there were no words there. And so I thought, well, I'm not writing that poem, I guess. And I thought, well, wait, wait, it was all in your head at one time, you could do this. So I actually sat down and recreated in myself the feeling of being there. And then I could supplement that with research from the website and from a book I had bought while I was there about the butterflies. And they just seemed so magical. And it, the poem itself is its quite deliberate in that you are entering the garden as though it's the garden with a capital G and a G back into this refuge. And then you have to go back through this dark tunnel, back out into the real world and back to the hospital to find out what they think about your survival likelihood. Um, so it was, it was a, definitely a refuge and a sort of, for me, just this very magical experience, so otherworldly. Mm -hmm. And so I had to end up writing the poem, even, even though I pressed the wrong button and had no notes at all when I got home. Well, the sense of reconstruction might have accentuated the sense of re refuge in its own way, you know, very I'm, much. I'm just grateful I was able to, able to do it. 
That's great. And our last question, um, and for Susan, comes from Amy Miller. Can you talk about surrealism in your work? Is it a conscious choice for describing your reality? It's a little bit connected to what I asked you, too, um, but a little bit more direct and probably more understandable. <laughs> no, I don't think of myself actually as being particularly surreal. When I think of surreal, I think of like Charles Simic or my friend Zach Schomburg who, or James Tate, you know? So I don't really think of my poetry as that surreal, <laughs> um, which is maybe the first sign that I need help. Um, but um, so it just kind of, it's just kind of the way stuff comes out, I guess. Um, we had another, uh, Amanda Powell, one of our poets, uh, refer to it as I, I love the combo of close natural description and surrealistic whimsy. <laughs> so that's, anyway, that's you've, got some, you, you've struck some chords with our viewers uh, in a way. Well, thank you both of you for such a wonderful and rich reading. We really appreciate your coming tonight. And please do um, view all the wonderful accolades that, that are on the website. You can just yeah. go to it and um, we, we you really have stirred uh, quite a response, and that's wonderful. Any last statements you want to make, Wendy? Or just uh, thank you again, Henry, for um, making Windfall possible. Um, it's been such a treat, and thank you both for um, concluding this season with such wonderful, strong poems. So moving, and it's just been a delight to be involved with this. So thank you both, and thank you, Henry, as well. And thank, thank you, for, thank you for having us. Thank you so much. Thank Pleasure. you so much. It's lovely for having us. And we'll see our viewers in September. Yes, see you in September. All right. Thank Wonderful. you. Good night, everyone. Good night.